Episode 177 of the TV Dudes Podcast, recorded March 29th, 2018. Murderers and Deplorables. Say what you will, guys, about the the zombies and San Clarita diet or, you know, Barry's a hard assassin. They didn't vote for Trump. I mean, this is something that we saw a a very interesting tweet about this week. Someone uh, asked, hey, guys, do you who in the Friends cast do you think voted for Trump? (laughs) And this got me thinking, at least, about all TV shows and all characters. I'm like, who would be the Trump voters? Because... We got to admit, guys, we were kind of caught off guard by the whole Trump winning thing. And by kind of, I mean entirely on the floor. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that can be summed up best by Dave Chappelle's SNL sketch. Yeah, where, where the everyone, yeah, the, the black where people the, were all the expecting The two it. black friends yeah. at the election watching party yep. are just like watching the five white people get more and more shocked at the returns. And they're just like, oh, yeah, how could America <laughs> go with a racist? <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless... You have to assume a lot of those people that you don't think would vote him did. Yep. Somehow yep. they rationalized it and it, it happened. Uh, I think we should discuss that on a Patreon episode. We don't usually do TV on Patreon, but I believe that this is a good Patreon topic. Yeah, I, I feel like it, it's an archetypical sitcom 90s enough. They each had their own quirks that that actually turned into a really fun discussion. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, uh, that's a good reason for us to go ahead and plug our Patreon page, huh? Oh, that's really well. That's good that you did that well. Nice. I segue. wrote in on my segue. And uh, <laughs> hey, guys, patreon.com slash TV dudes, there you can make a per episode pledge. Go check it out. What, what does that mean? A per episode pledge? You give us a dollar or two, because the only way we make money and fund this little show that we do is because of you guys. And you give us a, a couple bucks, and in exchange, we do these little mini episodes that are exclusive. They're just for you people that uh, are the ones who are helping support our show. Sometimes we learn the best superpower is being rich. Yeah. Sometimes uh, we talk about our fashion or lack thereof. Sometimes we discuss which Friends cast member is most racist. Yes. I, I would like to point out that uh, if you give us like a, a dollar an episode, what, what, how many tacos would that be? That would be eight tacos a month. Eight Jack in the Box tacos. <laughs> I was like, what level of taco are we talking about? We're talking about like Jack, Jack in the, in the Box, box. like top tier, the best quality taco you can get in America. Jack in the Box tacos. Uh, the opinions of Grant do not represent the opinions of all the TV dudes. If you can forego eight of those tacos in a month, you guys could support us. I could forego so many Jack in the Box tacos. Oh, man. Send them my way. For less than the, <laughs> for less than the cost of eight tacos a month. You can, <laughs> uh, on the you can support quality taco. programming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did we introduce ourselves? Nope. We're all over the no. place. Hey, we're the TV dudes. I'm Grant. I'm Randy. I'm Les. And yeah, we're going to be talking about a bunch of shows that have murderers or deplorable people. Yep. Uh, that includes Roseanne, Silicon Valley, Barry, both of those are on HBO, Mary Kills People, and Santa Clarita Diet, Season 2. Yep. But before we get into all that, I already did the whole Patreon thing. But hey, you know the way you guys can support us? iTunes. Yeah, you can go there and uh, buy the new album from Beyonce, and that supports us, right? Uh, no, well, they can give us a five-star rating. Oh, right or that, or that. Is her new album even on iTunes? I don't know. It seems like it would be on some kind of private streaming network that only takes... Uh, <laughs> Bitcoin? I don't know, Hova Coin or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so go to iTunes, find us, and write a little review, just like Alec42 did. Yeah. Hey, Alec, you wrote, started funny, stayed amazing. Five oh, yeah. stars. These guys are absolutely hilarious and informative. They talk about 99% of the TV that I watch on TV and give their honest opinions without the need to pander to what their audience want them to say. I don't know if that's true. I think we do try to pander. I don't know. I think that's code for they don't talk about things I wish they'd talk about. (laughs) Uh, They're friendly, geeky, and share great chemistry and inside jokes with each other were impenetrable yep yep <laughs> uh, i found these guys via spill.com and now they've evolved into something inhumanely with great potential we're inhuman 
Oh, because you you have to review season two of Inhumans, dude. <laughs> Damn it! Get ready for that. There's no season two coming. They're a chill group of men and women, woman, woman, and I really hope they continue this podcast for decades, nay, centuries to come. I see a problem with centuries, but I'm willing to give it a try. Yeah. But... By the way, in honor of Brooklyn Nine Nine, I'd like to say, uh, started funny, stayed amazing. Name your sex tape. <laughs> 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 well played, sir. Well played. <laughs> no, I mean I could see us like re-sleeving and and you know keeping this going like alter carbon style. Yeah, I don't know if that's what we want to use the technology for, but I guess. I mean, will will podcasts remain that relevant for that? Yes, long? podcasts will be around forever, just like buggy whips and, and AM radio. Fuck, <laughs> really invested in this <laughs> podcast studio here. We're going to be really lucky if, like, even though Apple has nothing to do with it, the stack isn't called Pod Something or <laughs> yeah. uh, I Personality. Yes. <laughs> Uh, all right, guys. Well, let's uh, let's move over and talk about some news, huh? Yeah, you're not going to talk about our network. Oh, uh, we are proud members of the Permanent Record Network. Permanent Record Network. And uh, yeah, you guys should just go check out all the shows. We are a network of primarily TV focused podcasts, and you can go listen to ones that talk about uh, obscure TV shows. Less. Yes, I did one called The Good Die Young that's uh, in hiatus between uh, its first two seasons. And I, this first season covered The Middleman, which was a decade ago, one season show on ABC Family. That everyone should see and yes. then listen to the podcast. Randy did a similar one season show about terriers. About dogs. About, a dog. about dogs. Terriers. The show Terriers on FX, which is no longer streaming on Netflix. you got to buy it, just like Middleman. But <sighs> okay. Beach Cop Detectives. And uh, then you segue back to me. And Grant then did, Grant uh, did Star Trek one. That's right. Oh, and guess what? Star Trek never dies, guys. <laughs> I chose the winner. Star Trek dies for decades at a time, sir. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it was Star Trek podcast. And it actually got a thing called a second season. Yeah. Yeah. Rub that's, that that's in great. your face. That's great. All right. Let's jump over to the news, guys. <laughs> All right. So this is a story that ties directly into what we're going to be talking about. Uh, Roseanne premiere to the highest sitcom ratings in three years so if you want to know what people want in sitcoms they've been holding out for it they've been waiting to watch what they wanted was the point of view of a trump supporter you know tim allen is going what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> get my people on the phone now yeah, we're right? coming back like somewhere shatner's going shit my dad says shit <laughs> well yeah <laughs> yeah uh i I don't know if this speaks to Roseanne nostalgia or I that's mean, a huge is, part of it. There's Roseanne nostalgia. I wonder if Netflix actually released its numbers on Fuller House where they did. Oh, yeah, that's Netflix true. Netflix doesn't release numbers. That's true. That's true. ABC but, does. Yeah. But that was another giant revival. Yeah. But it beat out Will and Grace. We know that much. Oh, yeah. I mean, <sighs> that said, a huge part of this is both morbid curiosity yeah. about watching the first. Like, where is it going to sustain? Yeah. Um, because there's and, been a bunch of news, and they are hitting on one of the biggest topics. Yeah. Yeah. Also, the poor. they got back the whole cast. Yeah. Like, I really can't believe uh, Sarah Gilbert. Is it Sarah Gilbert? Is yeah, Sarah Gilbert. That's Dorian, right. Um, that she and Laurie Metcalf and uh, the kid that played... Uh, uh, the kid? D, uh, DJ. DJ. Yeah. Like, he's back and actually looks normal for an adult. Like, I, you really kind of wonder when child stars grow up, like... How, you know, when they bring him <laughs> back, like, is this kid going to look like Haley Joe Osment? Like, you're not going to redo Sixth Sense and, and have that work the same now. No, no. Poor Haley Joe Osment. I love I, him and stuff so now, but he's not what I thought he was going to no. grow up to. It's just his face didn't grow with the rest of his head. You know, I'll say this, too. <laughs> Prior to this being the highest sitcom rating, the highest sitcom was probably like Big Bang Theory or Two Broke Girls or something like that. So who really cares what's highest rated? I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. Fuck Roseanne. Yeah. Uh, but, all right. So just to run down a quick list of things that if we're if you're mad at Laura Inger, whatever her, fuck her name is. Yeah, uh, I am. Always. And, and Coulter or any Always. of these people. Yeah. Um, if, if Louis C.K. doesn't have a show. Like, it, I mean, I realize he actually did a sexual assault. Uh, that's not the same. But um, Roseanne in real life just recently has attacked Parkland school kids yep. uh, saying that they're fakes and they're crisis actors. She tweeted out a fake photo saying that David Hogg was given a Nazi salute and calling him a Nazi. She said all the Jews should get out of UC Davis and it should be bombed. I think it was UC Davis. Um, 
she promoted Pizzagate, saying that Sessions would never prosecute Hillary for uh, the absolutely fake, they don't even have a basement in that fucking building, stupid conspiracy theory. Like, she's not just a terrible person, she's a terrible person that uses the largest megaphone she has to talk other people into being worse. And now she has a sitcom. And yeah. now they're they're trying to make her white plight in some way identifiable and like relatable. And I'm like, ugh. I get the nostalgia. Like I like old school sitcoms now and then. Like just recently, Amazon Prime added uh, Cheers and like a, a bunch of other like sitcoms from that era. And every once in a while, I want that format. Like I'm doing shit around the house, and I don't want to pay attention to a, a mythology thing, and it's fun. And Roseanne. It is this, I mean, film, as far as style of making it, it's exactly the same fucking show that they were making originally. Well, we don't want to spoil how we actually felt about yeah. the oh, show. Oh, we'll get to Roseanne. <laughs> uh, but before that... <laughs> although we might have already. Let's talk about Donald Glover uh, being thrown out of the bus by FX. Oh, yeah. What, so this is weird. That. First of all, Atlanta is a big hit for FX. So Stephen Glover and Donald Glover are the ones who do Atlanta for FXX. It's a big show for them. And you'd think the last thing you want to do is, is scotch that relationship in any way. Um, but they were working on an R-rated version of the, Merc the Deadpool cartoon. And the, basically FX said it was canceled and blamed creative differences. And then I guess the, the talk got to be that uh, he was that, did, that Glover hadn't even started the script, but he was too busy. Yeah, they, they tried to say that he didn't have time for it. Yeah. yeah, and then he tweeted, for the record, I wasn't too busy to work on Deadpool. And then he posted a script from the proposed finale of the show. Like 15 pages he yeah. tweeted out of it. Yeah, like, and, and, as it, a serious, like, and it makes reference to stuff that happened within like 24 hours of him post. He just yeah. wrote that, like yeah. wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it sounds like whatever happened... It's not going to happen. No Deadpool, which is – I don't care. I hate Deadpool. But I would have loved to have seen what these guys would have done with the animated R-rated Deadpool. And I don't understand where FX decides to do that to Donald Glover. I mean, they need Donald Glover. Yeah. It seems like a bad call, guys. And it doesn't look good for you when Donald Glover is currently like the new hot guy. Yeah. I mean, I get, I get how easy it is for somebody at FX to have idly said, oh, Glover's busy as fuck. Yeah. But you got to run a tighter ship than that. Yeah. Finally, in God, this show is cursed news. Lock and Key uh, is Joe Hill, Stephen King's son. It was his, it was his comic book project. It was very beloved in the comics. Uh, the, the there, was a, there was there was a pilot. There was a pilot that was never. It was it's you can see it on the internet probably, but they they I didn't go forward with about it. that pilot. Though. Yeah, it's difficult well, to find they even. They didn't go forward with it. Um. They are also not going forward with the Hulu pilot that is shot. Hulu greenlit the pilot in 2017, uh, included Danny Glover, uh, Nick Cordry, uh, Carlton Cuse was on board, and apparently didn't get picked up. It's not meant to be. Will I guess not. Show, I mean, will they at least mock in Berlin this thing? Can, I, like, don't, I don't think we're going to see it. Because, like, I mean, like, at least mock in Berlin didn't get picked up, but they showed it like a Halloween special, basically. Right, right. Hmm. I don't yeah, know. I doubt it. They're, they're, apparently, they say they're shopping it around to a Apple, Amazon, and Netflix, which I didn't know you could do if Hulu had to make the pilot, but I don't know. I guess it depends on how you're. Yeah, maybe they still Hulu kind of reads. outsource with the production company. Yeah, I mean, a lot, like some stuff's on Hulu original and some stuff's a Hulu original that already existed and they bought. Yeah, yeah. Like Awesomeness TV makes freakish. But yeah, it's, it's, it's too bad. Um, I, I can imagine a good TV version of this show, but maybe they just can't make it. Oh, well. Well, hey, let's take a quick break so we can come back and talk about how much we hated Roseanne. guys yeah we may have mentioned this a little bit we may have shown our hand a little bit too early but uh rosanna's back and yeah. it it was a pretty big feat for them to have assembled the full cast again brought Honestly, them back yeah 
And kudos to you guys. But I I don't know. There's there's mixed reaction. And I see some people that are like, oh, that was like a, a pretty good show. And I'm like, did you see the same thing I saw? <laughs> so here's my question. As First of all, I did not watch it. I've never seen an episode of Roseanne in my life. No desire to watch it. Um, so all I will be saying is asking questions because last time I talked about a show I hadn't watched all the way through, I got a, my, a new asshole torn. Well, Les and I, uh, Les brought up a great point. Yep. He said, you know what? We did this with our cartoon president yep. where we reviewed a show that we hadn't watched just because we hated the concept so much. Uh -huh. So we should actually right. sit down and watch it. I, I think you, you and I both watched yep. the first two episodes. Yes, yeah, and I still defend the... Our cartoon president was a stupid joke made to the choir uh, that uh, that I found just offensive on its nose. Like, Roseanne at least announced itself trying to be a Trump supporter in a family and how you deal with that a year and a half, you know, in, like... That's, Opening the conversation. That's a story that gap, I... Right? I I, I don't know that I want to watch it on a sitcom, but that's a story that needs to start happening. And Roseanne's reputation from its previous, not Roseanne the person, but the, the show Roseanne, which nailing that distinction down is early is going to get more important <laughs> as we go in this discussion. Um, Roseanne the show's previous reputation was the show that might have been able to do that. You, you know, the, they, they do something kind of amusing in the very beginning. They, they start the show with... Uh, Roseanne waking Dan up and saying, oh, man, I thought you were dead, which is a great <laughs> nod to they, how the show ended. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like they did some tight sitcom writing, like for the show, like for the, the type of sitcom. It's just impossible for me to just watch it as a sitcom because it's giving platform to a person that is as abhorrent as Ann Coulter. Yeah, but the 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 sort of behind the scenes meta uh, inside jokes that they were able to make, yeah. uh, the script that Roseanne the character had written, which basically ties in as well the what that last episode year and all was. That shit. Yeah, yeah. it's like oh, she wrote a script, and that's what we were watching in that other final yeah. season. Mm -hmm. um, and then Dan gets how to they make a joke about it, like you should have killed off the main character. Yeah, how they bring back. Uh, uh, what's her name? Sarah, Sarah Chalk. Yeah, they have both Beckys in there, but like one is a different character who wants uh, the other one to be her surrogate mother. Yeah. But I love they do a whole like it's look it's like looking in a mirror. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You look like me before I put on makeup. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know, seeing some of that dynamic, I'm like, okay, this is this is cute. It's pretty. It's handled pretty well. I think how they they have Laurie Metcalf's character spar off against Roseanne and have them both coming from the two ideological camps was somewhat interesting, except for that they couldn't have Laurie Metcalf's character like be genuine. She, she has to be the over the top kind of. They do it character. and do it badly. Like I don't know if you get fucking points for that. Like like Roseanne gets to um, preach. Her oh. her stance on why she supports Trump, and in in some way like come across as like the rational hero with all the. And I'm sorry I did it, but it was the adult thing to do, and we all had to listen. I know that you want health care for everybody down, because yeah. you have a good heart, but you just can't do math because you're an idiot, right? Uh, like, and, and 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 that's the end of it. And and if. If and we she were, doesn't have to apologize, and they they end with that note, and I'm like, she forgives Lori Metcalf. Yeah, what am I supposed to take from this episode of of any gap being bridged here? Like, you guys are showing Roseanne's perspective, but you're glossing over the terrible hypocrisy that's going on with the fact that she's able to support those views, and yeah, she has a a I guess gender fluid grandson. She's got a, a black granddaughter. Yeah. And Dan makes a couple of like, you know, you know, oh the the grandchild's exploring. Please let him explore his way to the boy's side of the target. Like Dan makes a couple of and I'm like, John old Goodman, funny grandparent you jokes. Too? Uh. Yeah. But Roseanne Barr herself uh at one point I think supported Jill Stein, but she got in arguments online about uh how trans women shouldn't be allowed in women's bathrooms uh that you know women don't like if you have a penis you're not a woman and you shouldn't be waving them in women's faces like that um uh, i just recently watched the new ricky gervais 
stand up mm-hmm. on Netflix. It's a it's a bit of a mixed bag. His fangs are weird. <laughs> His fangs are weird too, and he he goes into some areas where I'm just like, ah, eh, fuck you, dude. But he also really emphasized, you know, in the world of comedy, context matters, and. In the world of watching Roseanne, I cannot divorce this show from the real life counterpart part that Roseanne is, and what she actually stands for, and what those actual uh, values and what's going on in our country are right now. So when I see that she now has this platform to kind of champion uh, her way of rationalizing her choice there, I'm just like, no, fuck you. And like, like Les is saying, she's full on conspiracy nut attacking little kids who like, who got um, injured in the in the school shooting. Yeah, she's, 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 she's fucking terrible. Called some of the Parkland called one of the Parkland kids a Nazi and shared a doctored photo of him That's with fake kid. audio. Uh, she supported the Pizzagate thing and tweeted that out. Uh, and the show is a is a plot like. The, I realize that she's one person in a cast, but she's not. The original Roseanne, she was personally what who pushed for there to be a gay character. Like, she personally pushed for these progressive things in the original Roseanne, which was a show about working class people trying to push to this better world. Now we're somewhat in some of that better world where, like, Sandra Bernhardt could be herself and, like, uh, all the other – Laurie Metcalf came out in the last episode. Uh, Jackie did it. Uh, and now I feel like this show is pining for 1988 and 1990, you know, that like it's pining for a world that it used to want to get out of. I think there could be some merit to the idea of of showing these these divided worlds and how family still tries to come together and has that conversation. But I don't think that they are showing a balanced conversation within the family. No. Like Roseanne is the matriarch, and she dominates, and her word is final. Yeah. And and anyone who challenges those views is eventually kind of played off as a joke. Whatever deep conversation they're going to have about this issue or whatever on this, and they're going to keep trying to do it, it's always going to end in a... Like spike the ball back in your face, burn line from yeah. Roseanne. Yeah, uh, she, she's going to win. She's going to win the argument. And I'm like, what is the value to this? It it, it feels very disingenuous. I guess. So, for example, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, if I saw two people ten years ago saw two people on television have an argument of like, uh, oh, you just want health care for everybody because you have a good heart, but you can't do simple math, and that's where it ended. I would be like, okay, that's about where this conversation ends in public right now. But in 2018, Lori Metcalf, uh, Jackie can't have looked back and gone, every other developed nation in the world manages something like what I'm talking about. <laughs> you can't fucking say yeah. that anymore and, and walk away like, oh, mic drop, bitches, Roseanne. Like, fuck you for normalizing this shitty conversation again. Yeah, yeah. It, it sounds to me like you guys don't support President Trump. <laughs> It's not that I don't support the president. It's that I do support immigrant rights and trans people and gay people and poor people. And uh, he doesn't. So it's just that our values aren't aligned, you know? What did you think of the second episode? Because I will I will say Honestly, this. the fact that she said shit about trans people before made me want to lose it through the whole fucking thing. Like, yes, you've been a cyber bully to fucking high school kids. Fuck you for acting like you're protecting your grandkid now. Yeah, that's bullshit. But I, I thought the idea of the characters themselves having those kind of older ideas about um, how how kids want to express their identity and really trying to cling to them hiding and 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 keeping their head down and and just going with the flow to avoid being bullied versus you know proudly representing who yeah. they are i thought how uh both roseanne and john goodman's characters like portrayed that mm-hmm. it felt a little bit more real authentic and and how that gradually moved to them coming to a better acceptance of the kids identity versus the kid having to relinquish anything i appreciated yeah and i was like okay i from the trying to have the morality of the episode presented there i appreciated how they developed 
that storyline. I still watch this show and I'm not laughing at anything and I'm fucking tired of the multicam uh sitcom. It's it's a dead format and it it does nothing for me. I never I'm purposefully not amused by any scenes in the show because I hear an audience laughing. So again, eight out of ten? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't entirely been listening. Uh, I I will say, I Ida is it Ida Madison, Ira Madison. Ira Madison. Yeah, uh, I, I, who I follow on Twitter uh, posted a long thread about most of what I've just ranted in a long breath about Roseanne uh, that nailed everything I felt about watching those episodes, and it ended with something that I took his advice on and and feel should be promoted more. Netflix has two seasons already of a sitcom revival called uh, One Day at a Time. That is a uh, Cuban family or, or American family of Cuban descent. They've got the grandmother living with them, the mom, uh, daughter, and son. The daughter's, uh, I believe, across the first season comes out as gay. So you have old school culture issues dealing with, you know, a quinceanera for a gay girl, uh, you know, these kind of, like you have those kind of issues dealt with on a sitcom. The mom is trying to put herself through school while working a job. And she, uh, just got back from a tour in Afghanistan. Like it, and it's the multicam sitcom format, uh, old school laugh track type sitcom. So if, if you're covering yourself saying, well, I'm just watching Roseanne because, you know, I really like that sitcom format. Um, you can watch a different sitcom that doesn't support, uh, somebody that's tweeted out Pizzagate and trolls high school kids and Roseanne shouldn't have a fucking job on television. If we're holding all these other people's feet to the fire for being terrible people in 2018, our president excluded, um, <laughs> then Roseanne fits that bill. She should be held account accountable too. She does not deserve to have one of the highest grossing how does sitcoms it, nowadays. How is ABC back? You know what would be hysterical to me? I brought this up to Grant earlier. What would be hysterical to me is if they Valerie Bertinelli this. That was about money, and so of course it happened, and this is about ethics. You'll have to so explain the Valerie it's, I know, I know I will. So once upon a time, there was a show called Valerie, and it mm -hmm. starred a woman called Valerie Bertinelli yep. and her whole family, and Valerie, in between season one and two, uh, Miss Bertinelli asked for what was probably just a reasonable increase towards pay equity with like the lowest level male cast member. But it's the so network tragic. slapped her the fuck down. Mm -hmm. She assumed she had the clout to do it because, you know, her name was the name of the show. Yep. Uh, and like, why wouldn't she right? assume that? Yep. So season two of Valerie is called The Hogan Family. <laughs> they killed her off camera between seasons. <laughs> I think it would be fucking hysterical if Roseanne died between seasons. And it's just called The Connors. <laughs> and it's just called The Connor Family. <laughs> and they continue and on that honestly would be hysterical or because it's Roseanne they could also recast her a la Becky and no one notice oh my god they'd be amazing who, who would be the best uh, super liberal person to cast Annabella as Sioria <laughs> no uh, get uh what's her name uh, Melissa McCarthy in there <laughs> <laughs> she can toggle between uh, Roseanne and Sean Spicer uh all right, guys. Well, let's jump over to some shows over on HBO that uh, probably will make us a little less angry. Uh, first up, Silicon Valley is back for yep. its, is this fifth or sixth season? Fifth. Fifth season. Yep. And I love it. And I love it even more because uh, T.J. Miller's not even there. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I There was a long period there where I liked T.J. Miller, and I found out how terrible he was and that that was not acting. So his exit from the show started actually right before the sexual yeah. uh yeah, yeah, all the he was, yeah, yeah. yeah, he just left because he was a shitty person. And nobody wanted to work with him. Yeah, well, and, and I've heard, I mean, I've heard that he's difficult on set. Um, I well, actually, I guess we'll probably release this interview next week or so. But I, I just got to interview uh, Jimmy O Yang that plays uh, Jin Yang on the show. Yeah, and uh, and read his book, and uh, and he doesn't speak ill of Miller, but no, who I, knows? no, yeah, I wouldn't imagine he would publicly. That, that'd be crazy. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I, I. Think that it's undeniable that T.J. Miller was is extremely talented. He's funny. Yeah. He's got yeah. great voice and comedic timing. The guy knows how to riff effortlessly. Yeah, but he's also apparently a huge pain in the ass. He wouldn't show up to time on time to set, and uh, was difficult to work with. And you know, then he also had some personal life problems. And so, I I feel like 
he acted as a foil who was unnecessary at a certain point because it proved that the rest of the cast was a foil enough to themselves. Well, and yeah, part of his season four plot line was flailing. Like was yeah. like that was that was like literally what he was doing was not knowing where he fit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I I've been reading some of the interviews behind the scenes about this show. And what we get to see here is that the show, the, 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 the group, the Pied Piper gang, are finally gaining success. And they're able to start growing their business because it's, it's getting real. And we also see that Richard Hendricks is suddenly, not suddenly, but he's starting to a little bit come into his own as a CEO and recognize how the game is played. Mm-hmm. And be able to start making some moves that seem smart that seemed ballsy and actually able to exert some degree of force which he was not that character at all in the first in the previous season and yet he's still richer which means he still uses the force when he shouldn't yeah he's still got this emotional overreach like he still spikes the ball when he shouldn't yeah like, yeah you know it silicon valley is like the anti-entourage entourage was a bunch of dude bros succeeding despite Everything going, they're doing everything wrong. They succeeded despite the world being against, despite the world, uh, despite how bad they were at everything. Uh, Silicon Valley is about very smart people who should in no way succeed, who should, should they have everything stacked against them. They're bad at this job and, and they managed to pull it out. Yeah. Which very, I'd rather see that. Very earnest, very smart people yeah. almost getting in their own way. Yeah. But uh, I, I guess that was sort of my point. What I was reading about uh, with, you know, what, what's the dude's name uh, that created the show? Uh, Mike Judge. Mike Judge. Yep. Is that you, at a certain point, if you're going to keep going for this many seasons in a show, you can't just keep it the joke that they're always going to lose. No, no. Eventually, they have to start winning. Yeah. And I'm glad that it seems they're going in that direction finally, because I'm like, these guys can't just keep being their own worst enemy and tripping over themselves or 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 at, or at a certain point I don't even want to watch them and root for them. But anymore. they've they've always been moving forward. It's just that they uh, there's every time it comes up with a challenge, they tackle it in the most awkward way possible. Ultimately they 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 will come through stronger because they are smart people and they do have the talent. I mean, we have been shown that Dinesh and uh, Gilfoy are both extremely skilled coders. Like they may have personality disorders, but they're both supposed to be very good at their jobs. And the same is true of Richard. Richard is not – he's not an idiot. He's socially maladjusted, but he is very good at coding, and he's very good at sort of his ideas. Yeah. He, so they they have skills, but their personalities cause the – run into those skills. And I think that that balance is what makes Silicon Valley work. Like I don't want them to become – the next Google or anything. I like them kind of struggling, but they struggle forward. They don't keep they don't keep falling back to the same status quo. Yeah, I just want them to to start having some more like actual gains, actual wins that legitimize everything that we as an audience have gone through in rooting for them this many seasons. Yeah. Like yeah, it can't just be that they keep fucking up at the last minute and something crazy that they didn't anticipate all of a sudden comes in. Yeah. yeah. Cause like they've been at the cusp of hiring people or like they just hired 50 people in the yeah. first, day. like, so like they've hired up for a week or two before and, or almost gotten this far before. And then it, it's either like made a right turn or imploded or something. Yeah. So like, I'd like to see them get to that next series, like that next stage. And you know, in a way it makes sense. I know that a lot of these startup businesses, they flail about for years and before they're able to find the right kind of uh, vision and, and product that actually catapults them to that next level. So in a way people are constantly in this industry tripping upwards. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm glad to see it will start moving in a little bit more of a, a winning direction. Well, my favorite thing about this this episode was the runner about uh, Richard and the pizza guy because uh, we see him, he meets him, line. and he hates that guy. the The guy's dumb. He's managed to luck into some stupid idea that sounds like he it's reminds gonna be... me of Fred Savage. Somehow. Yeah, he's he's like, a... yeah. and then. And then he screws up Richard's meeting with his old with his with with his old employee, and he's going to buy her coders, and he's got all the leverage, and he's enjoying it. And then this guy just haplessly fucks that up for him. And instead of that being like you know a runner, at the end of the episode, Richard has turned his skilled coders and his actual knowledge of how to do this, and basically screwed this tech bro completely. Because mm-hmm. when he gives when he tells him what the deal is about how much money they're going to lose on the pizzas, because he's got a code to order pizzas and. That was a great little moment, and they didn't undercut it. There was no point at which Richard, like, the, the, the code failed or anything like that. No, no. It succeeded, and they won. 
And then once they won, you see the personality stuff, which is that Richard cannot handle the pressure. And he makes he basically looks bad, even though he succeeded. He looks yeah. bad. He gets uh, what's her name to uh, back his play. Yeah. Which is a, a pretty big gamble because they can hardly ha- it, handle managing. It's a few kind people, of a stupid alone. emotional play. Like, yeah. like yeah. he shouldn't have like. You wanted vengeance. This is yeah. stupid. You, yeah. but there, I, I mean, I, I see the business aspect as well because you yeah. know he's going head to head against uh, the Hooli dude, who's uh, like sabotaging his every move, yeah. and so he needed to do something to gain. One people. thing I did love, I I absolutely did not want to watch a season where Hooli tried to build a competing product exactly right. the same again. Like, yeah. I just didn't want to watch like, oh, Hooli's going to get into the distributed internet business mm-hmm. and they're going to go head to head. So I really loved the yes. moment where like, yeah, Gavin fucks him on the coders, but then he's like, oh no no, that's the one thing you can't work on here yeah he's like <laughs> like he's literally like, any other thing you think of yeah. him, but not that him finding out what the numbers were for box 2.0 and how he has to build That's a thing great i love gavin as a villain but i also love that gavin gets to be miserable all the time too like gavin yeah. never gets what he wants yeah yeah that he looks <laughs> utterly unhappy like russ henneman's constantly losing but at least looks like somewhat yeah pleased with himself yeah very pleased with himself <laughs> Oh, man, I, I want to see more Russ Hanneman this season. Also, too. I love Ben Feldman whenever he turns up as the lawyer in this. Yes. He's so good. And I love Jin Yang's. Jin uh, Yang's, my favorite thing about Jin Yang this time was when he comes in and is ranting about the, the cost of shipping a body to yes. China. And they all are like, I don't think any of that made any sense. And it made ex- it made perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, you know us, exactly what yeah. he's talking about. Yeah, we he's, all know exactly what he's talking yeah. about, but it was gibberish to them. I, I love that bit. So uh, the art, like, Jin Yang was, like, three episodes, like, guest star in the first season and then became a regular in the second season and then, like, has has surprised me how, like, that character didn't fade away but, but has b- became this beautiful foil for uh, Eric. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, like, purposely fucks his name up all the time. Yep. Um, and I like in this in the newest episode, I think he says, like, you know, do you think Ehrlich would like those guys uh, staying here? Like, no, that's why I invited <laughs> yes, them. Yes. This would piss him off. I like I hate him. I don't I hate know. Him. I don't understand. Yeah, I, I, I love that, <laughs> that basically like Jin Yang is arced into like a villain almost. Yeah. He, he tells him like, oh, no, no, you guys are all part of the previous administration. Yeah, like he considers yeah. them part of the Ehrlich administration, yeah. yep. and and thus they are villains as like to him, yeah. like their enemy as well. Like I love the the sneaky transformation of him into a villain is awesome. Him yeah. uh, squat stealing <laughs> Ehrlich's house and now trying to get him, uh, I guess across declared the season dead. he's going to try and get him declared dead. Yes, I mean I wonder if we're going to see that Jin Yang will somehow be the. The straw that, in a way, breaks Pied Piper's back. Like, well, you saw how how thrilled he was the possibility of gaining that ten percent. I love that he he'd yeah. heard Ehrlich say it, but thought it was fake. Yeah, like, wait, that's real. That's real. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, he's like, yeah, I mean, I'm declared dead. And I mean, that's that's I will his go game. get a certificate he's, now. <laughs> he's gonna get him declared dead so he can get his house, but also so he can get his Pied Piper stock. Mm-hmm. It's because he brilliant. knows it's valuable. It's and that would be great plot wise just to have him fold into the gang and yeah. be a part of it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because I love that character too. Yeah. Oh, and you just interviewed him, right? Yeah. So, uh, hey, stay tuned for that. I think we'll release that on Monday. Yep. So you guys need to listen to that. Les has been doing interviews with a ton of great uh, actors. Every Monday. Producers and directors lately. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes it's Tuesdays or Wednesdays if I don't post it on time. Every Monday. If it's not up there, yell at Grant. Yell at me. Uh, All right, let's move on to Barry, which is the new Bill Hader, I'm a serial killer who wants to be an actor. uh, Not a serial killer. He's a hitman. Hitman, Hitman. sorry. Yeah, it's it's gross point blank. It's gross point blank plus get shorty. Yes. And I hadn't. But I like it better than gross point blank. I love gross point blank and I love get shorty and I love this. Yeah. I really enjoyed this. And, you know, similar to Silicon Valley, it's one of those shows that I'm like, Oh, it ended too soon. I want. I yeah, want, like, I shouldn't have started yeah. this week to week, man. Yeah, I'm yeah. just like I'm really <laughs> invested already in this character, and I want to see where he goes. And it's really interesting because he's a hitman. Yeah, and I'm I like him. Like how well, they navigated making him a likable character. That's what I think is the most interesting thing. This is what they did in Gross Point Blank. Was it was the notion of sort of the combat trauma had basically hollowed this guy out, and so. He, you know, in Gross Point Blank, he goes back to the girl he loved in the high school he mm-hmm. loved and all that kind of stuff. And he's trying to figure out where his life went wrong and kind of put his life back together. Bill Hader's Barry, uh, Barry Berkman, or a.k.a. Uh, Barry, Block. Block. Barry Block, is uh, he's a guy who was like an Afghanistan vet and mm-hmm. he fell apart and he is 
uncle sort of slip, slipped him into contract killing, and he doesn't. Yeah, he does. He does. He just does it. He's exceptionally good at. it. He's got the skills, but he doesn't have the temperament. He doesn't want to kill people. I spent half the first episode wondering though if Stephen Root was real. <laughs> I think he is though, but yeah, he's real. He's but no, real. it turns but, yeah. him into like a lost in translation kind of thing. Yeah, like he's walking around like not part of society yeah. anymore. He's yeah. just off, and and I love that he follows his mark. Yeah. To like like his partner in the acting class is he really likes the doofus like yeah how they figured out the way to work him up onto stage to do an acting line with a guy yeah and and that the drive was actually that you know Barry the character would really want to do that yeah and how he gets the audience to applause and that's so affirming to him and like he suddenly like. What they established about the character, even in little moments, like the few things he says to Stephen Root's character, yeah, uh, you get a real sense of this guy just being lost and wanting to belong somewhere. Yeah, and they succeeded in establishing the character perfectly, so that I bought into every moment of this. There's there's a one line between him and Stephen Root that there's some amount of money that like, and and we're almost there. Yeah. on like the amount of money we need for something that ends this. Yeah, but that's you know that's going to be like baby dry. Like that's always going to be strung right. out a little yeah. bit. Well, I also I think there's the other thing is that he meets this girl. Um, Sal- Sally, played by Sarah Goldberg, and mm-hmm. it's like a light goes on, and so there's two things. He loves the idea of the theater, but he also this girl is like awakened a human part of him that hasn't been around for yeah. a while. I love Henry Winkler in pretty much everything. Oh, man, Henry Winkler's so and, good and he's here. Great in this, is well, that how that's, he berates and takes people down. And is like, yes, and use it. <laughs> that's that's what makes me remind, reminds me of Get Shorty. Mm-hmm. Gene Hackman's character in Get Shorty is like. He's this badass producer, and when he runs against mafia and against mafia people, he tries to be to use his you know in, in Hollywood he scares the hell out of people. Mafia people just kick the shit out of him. Yeah, and I have this feeling that might be coming for Henry Winkler at some point. Is you said uh, the actress's name is uh, uh, is Sarah, uh, Sarah Goldberg. Sarah Goldberg. The moment she has after Winkler does that yeah. of like just destroys her and then like, and use it, she she actually pulls a moment where you see it dawn on her. Yeah. Oh my God, that's the feeling. And really, it, it, yeah. like, I was like, holy shit, everybody in this scene's killing it. Like, yeah, how it's always interesting to me to see a great actor be able to play a bad actor yeah. who transitions into a pretty good actor. And that underlaying surface is, or under that yeah. underlayer is that it's a great actor who's yeah. doing all it's this. Like for hearing, us. It's like hearing Hugh Laurie do an American doing a bad British accent. Yeah. Like yeah. He, he would do a mocking British accent on House, and I'd just sit there and like, fuck are you doing that yeah <laughs> yeah i think steven root here I, I always like steven root he's not super used here he's only in a few scenes but he kills in every scene he's in bill Hader. this is my favorite work i've seen from him yes yeah this he, is skeleton twins good because is... he pulls off the not just the comedy but the but the drama aspect yeah. of it like that last bit where he goes into killing mode and he's like telling the guy he's like don't 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 aim that at me. Wasn't that intense? That and was great. I, I he, love how they have the. He stands yeah, there shooting. and waits for the guy to get it unjammed. Of, yeah. of man, if you just leave it jammed, just don't. Yeah, yeah. It's like I'm not going to. Sh- he does not want to kill those guys, but once once the trigger is set, kills them all. Officially. Strips the gun, yeah. throws it apart, walks. But away. Yeah. he's screwed, right? Yeah, the, the he's camera. screwed. There's a camera. It's got a full the, full the, the face. Camera, that and right? one of those guys crawled out of the car. Well, but the, the, cops... the guy with no hair. Yes, uh, Noho yeah. Hank. Is yeah, Noho name? Hank. Which but, I love that actor. He's been in Gotham. He's been in a bunch of weird. But the, he... cops, the cops show up immediately after. Like, I'm, I'm thinking they're gonna find the camera, right? Like, there's gotta uh, be some. Unless point. Noho Hank grabbed it. Maybe. Him. No, uh, they show they show it on the dashboard, flashing. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> I the the best scene in this episode for me was when. Barry goes in and uh, hugs the guy that he's supposed to kill yeah, in the car, yeah. and they show Noho Hank yeah. in the other car. Go, what, <laughs> what the, the fuck? fuck? Yes, yes. That guy's reaction was just so perfect. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, yeah. I, I'm in love with this show right away. Also, little detail: the fact that his scene partner does the uh, scene from True Romance as his scene cracked me the hell up. I loved that. <laughs> that was so funny. I love that uh, he points out, or Stephen Root points out, like, th- that's a movie. That's not a play. That's not a scene from a play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, it's it's acting classes in L.A., I guess. All yeah. the theater is in, in addition, scenes. In addition to being a physical therapist who sleeps with his clients, he was probably not a very good actor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, guys. Well, let's move to a show on Hulu, which I guess initially came from Lifetime, called Mary Kills People. This comes from a recommendation from Les, and 
Uh, Randy hasn't seen it. I've not I seen saw it. A little bit of the first episode. This, is this the first Lifetime show we've ever talked about on the show? Uh, we didn't talk about Unreal, so I think yeah, so. Yeah, I think this yeah. is the first Lifetime so show. So that's the main reason I wanted to. I, Hulu has started picking up things that I honestly thought were Hulu originals for a minute. And then I realized, like, no, these seem like out of the blue shows because they're on Lifetime and I don't pay attention to that channel at all. And uh, so two have happened now. Unreal, which y'all spoke a little bit about. Season one was great. Season two was, hmm, I haven't gotten to watch season three yet. Um, and and now Mary Kills People. Mary Kills People is about an assisted suicide doc who's doing this illegal as fuck. Right? Yeah. Uh, and her uh, helper, who is an addict or ex-addict, uh, recovering addict. Uh, He's a plastic surgeon. Plastic surgeon, who's uh, clearly had his license pulled and is now basically acting as her physician's assistant while she does this shit and uh and they don't do injections they put it into a champagne glass and make it as classy as they can and of course shit goes wrong a couple times and uh hilarity ensues and uh the so, F- yeah is what what is the tone of this it's it's not, I mean, there are funny, like, there are black comedy moments. Showtime drama kind of deal? Showtime dramedy kind of thing? It feels a little bit, at first it felt a little bit like uh, Burn Notice to me. No, it's a little like, closer to Shameless, I think, than okay, Burn Notice. Like, right. it's got some funny moments. Like, they have to get the fuck out of a house from the second story, bef- like, while a wife's coming in. With the, the initial tone, I was like, like, oh, is this, like, kind of like a little bit of an action, like, murder yeah. on the go thing? But then, yeah, it didn't. But then, like, uh, her kid has... Uh, has some problems at school and like has a girlfriend that's a little wild and, and finds her mom's stash of drugs. Like they have a whole subplot where like she could get really screwed over by this kid getting hurt. If something were to happen with these stolen drugs and like, so it, it starts to get into some, like it's a more serious tone than shut eye. I feel like, okay. Um, but it, it could easily be, uh, up there with like shut eye or good behavior or something like that, or I mean not good, be- uh, good girls or something like that. Like okay. it, it feels like of that class, and I just didn't expect it from Lifetime at the, all. Yeah, the caliber here of show is pretty impressive, especially. I mean, you hear Lifetime and you go, "Oh, I, I, I know what the tone of Lifetime is." No, and that plastic surgeon could be Carl Urban's fucking stunt double. Like <laughs> the, when I first saw him, like Carl Urban's not in this show, right? Jay Ryan yeah. is the actor's name, and uh, the the lead. Uh, actress is Caroline Davernis. She's Mary uh, who kills. That's actually what got my attention because Caroline Davernis was in Hannibal and, of course, uh, Pushing, she not Pushing a, Daisies. Um, uh, Wonderfalls. Wonderfalls. Yeah. And I she love her. She does a great job. That's yeah. where I've seen her. She, yeah. she does a great job here. Yeah. I was really, I, I'm looking forward to watching some more of it. Uh, I just, Hulu's got it now and I really wouldn't have paid attention to Lifetime, but clearly they are making some original content show wise that I should uh, keep an eye out for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, and our last show that we're going to talk about over on Netflix, season two of Santa Clarita Diet. Yep. Uh, Drew Barrymore and uh, Josh Duhamel. Oh, Tim Oliphant. <laughs> I know. Yes. They look the same. No, they don't. No, One's don't. taller and lankier. That's it. I did not realize how much taller Joel McHale was than Tim Oliphant. What? Is he really? Uh, oh, Joel yeah. McHale's yeah. a monster. Yeah. Like, Tim Oliphant seems like a big deal. Like, Bullock from Deadwood, right? And Like, no. S- T- Joe McHale towers over him like Oliphant six one and McHale's like six four. Oh man! Um, so season one of this, you watched all of season one, right, Grant? I did. Did you like it? I can't remember where you I were. I did like it. I don't recall like being in love with it. Like at least to the point where I felt there was a drive to want to watch the second season right away. I remember liking it, but I think what I thought of it most was was that it was interesting and had potential. And I feel like season two realized that potential. I thought season two was notably better than season one. I, I feel like it like I binge season. I mean, it's Netflix. Sure. I binge season one in in like a quick pull, and yeah. And I feel like it was very light confectiony. Like when season two dropped, I found I had to go back. The recap didn't do it. I had to go back and rewatch the last <laughs> really? episode of season one because it it was just so funny and light and fluffy and, yeah. and like i laughed hard at season one but it didn't stick with me i couldn't have told you a fucking thing about it all i remember was it was a cliffhanger i remember thinking that was not an ending i forgot about throwing up the red ball thing i yeah. forgot about like so many weird like their zombies are weird yeah. um so my main complaint with season one was that the mythology stuff with Portia de rossi mm-hmm. that's all so fast at the end it's like yeah. the last two episodes oh, of the end like rossi boom entirely and then she's out, like she's there and yeah, gone. Yeah. And I remember, and then this, then the season's over. And I, yeah. I remember when season one ended, going, "No, you just started talking about the mythology yeah. of the show, yeah. and it's done." Yeah. And season two, 
was a little better about that, but it's still I guess you could the show left me wanting more. That's a positive thing. Yeah. But it still felt abrupt of like our I guess that's a fair place to end it. But Yeah, it it does feel like the the story's the story's rapid fire. Yeah. Uh the thing I liked about it, I watched all of it in one day. Like I, I really enjoyed it. I think it. I watched it across um, two days. But I loved the uh like the zombie girlfriend. Like I thought she was fun and then she was gone. Uh, yeah, uh, Ramona. <laughs> yeah, Ramona from the Rite Aid. Who she was hysterical anyway. Yeah, I liked her. I liked that story. Um, I love that. Yeah, yeah, that she wanted to always wanted to be a calmer, yes. more mundane person. I thought that was really interesting because yeah, it's like the opposite of yeah. what happened. I'm like, and oh, Nathan so it. Fillion's severed head for the whole season oh my was God. amazing. That was Gary fantastic. is great. Yep. Uh, I love that Natalie Morales got uh, more to do as the yep. deputy sheriff. Yep. Uh, I really, I really like where they end with her. Like that, yes, that, that was ending spectacular. was spectacular. By the way, the uh, I hadn't put it together, but when the when when give me a sign go, she said give me a sign, and you know what that is that explodes. Yeah, right? I know, and that killed me. I yeah. was dying. I was like, well, there goes uh, yeah. Gary's C four. <laughs> yeah, that was fantastic. Uh, that made me really happy. Um, I loved. I could kind of see where some of the things were going. Like they 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 played fair with the audience. Like when when she's wearing the the bracelets. And they record the thing. I'm like, you could see that coming. I'm like, what are you doing? When she went, yay! And yeah, I like, was like, well, that sounds yeah, gonna come back. Like yeah. a new, they telegraph that. Yeah, yeah. And they do telegraph, but I like the way they do it. The thing yeah. I think is interesting is compare this to iZombie, because it's similar, but way different. Because iZombie is about people who have reasons to be good at this kind of thing. They're they're they work in the police department. They're smart people. Realtors or realtors, realtors, which by the, the way, extra I syllable. love that they made fun of that because I was for the that extra call. Model. I remember calling that in season one how they pronounce realtors the weirdest fucking way, yep. and they actually called that out, and that cracked me up. Um, realtors have no reason, especially kind of uh, blow dried bonehead yeah. retail realtors like uh, Timothy Oliphant's character. Yeah, to be ready for this, yeah. they they're doing their best, but man, they are not equipped for this job. I did not know that Tim Oliphant <clears throat> was like the. Funniest son of a bitch alive. He's super funny. He's better here than he's in season one. He's better in season two than season one. Yeah. I don't know if his lines are better, if it's yeah. just the writing got tighter for him or what, yeah. but he, his whole like, honey, just trying to keep a smile on my face about this. <laughs> yeah. I, and the daughter's constant like, are you guys are up to some, every time, stop lying yes. to me. I stop love it. their daughter too. I think they did a great job with her. And I can't remember the kid's name. Uh, yeah. Her boyfriend. His, their, her, her fr- yeah, Not her, boyfriend. Yeah. Uh, the kid next door. He's amazing. That yeah. actor is – he's as good as uh, – when I first watched Reaper. Yeah. And and I thought, like, ah, oh, where the fuck did they find these guys? Yeah. Um, and that – like, I, I love uh, – all the cast of this is spectacular. Also, um, the he's only in a couple episodes, but the principal, um, who is from Reno 911, is, is it Ben Grant? Not is, Tom Lennon. It is Tom Lennon. Yeah. It's, it's Tom oh, yeah, Lennon. it's Thomas Lennon. Tom yeah. Lennon is the principal. There's a ama- there's that amazing bit where he's coming home and he's like mother makes me eat. I can only get sherbet she says I get and then they steal it they from take him. They his fucking sherbet. <laughs> it's so she good. won't let him press charges <laughs> about the yeah yeah yeah. This show um, the kids' names by the way are Eric and Abby, and the yeah. the kid is Skylar Gazondo is the name of the kid who plays separately. Eric. Their zombie mythology is different than any other show you've ever seen. Yeah and. Uh, Mr. Ball Legs is one of the best computer animation things I've ever seen in a TV show. <laughs> like for being a subtle CG effect, yeah. Mr. Ball Legs was creepy and perfect. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I really like this. I I love the mythology of it. You're right that it's it isn't that tight. Like it feels like they're just kind of like, hey, let's tell a bunch of funny stories and we're out. But I'm kind of okay with that. It's just that their mythology is so different and interesting that it's yeah. all I want to fucking hear about. Like, as soon as they brought up the Serb thing, oh, shit, uh, we should mention the Serb that they do in uh, <laughs> they season two. Casually that murder. They casually murder. Uh, oh, well, God. I mean, he did follow the teenage girl home. I and feel like that guy earned it. He's from other space. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, the weird looking dude. Yeah, and the, yeah. Go, the new Ghostbusters reboot. Yeah, 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 yeah that guy. <laughs> I love that guy. Uh, he's he's great. I can't find his name in the IMDb because there's a billion people on this show. But, yeah, I, I really like this. It's a lightweight, fast watch. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm actually looking forward to season three because I feel like they grew quite a bit from season one and season two. I'm inevitably going to watch it. I know <laughs> it's there. I started watching uh, this other show. Uh, what's it called? Wild Country. Is that what it is? The, the new uh, Netflix? Wild Wild Country. Is it Wild Wild Country? I think Wild so. Wild Country. Um wild wild country it's this uh documentary series that the duplass brothers like helped produce okay 
And it starts going into this whole cult that happened in the 80s that I'd never heard of because I was being born. Sure. Um, and it is fascinating. Anyway, <laughs> if you guys get a chance, go check that out as well. If you guys just don't have enough TV in your time. <laughs> <laughs> guys so if you like us over on our facebook page which is facebook.com slash tv dudes you guys can ask us questions once a week randy's pretty diligent about putting up a post yep sometimes i edit it midweek when we change the shows yeah we, we did uh, <laughs> switch what we were going to watch talk about because i think we were going to talk about uh counterpart this week Counterpart, but, but we decided that it, it hasn't it's not the finale is, the finale is actually the, yeah on sunday yeah i didn't realize that i think so, initially on wikipedia they had the finale listed as the 25th they did a two-part so uh, yeah. I think maybe that so like, threw things off. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about that next week. Uh, okay, first question comes to us from Jonathan Huffnagel, and uh, this one's a bit of a long one. Uh, he says, Dear TV dudes, uh, so this question this week is a pinch longer, but it speaks from the heart. Last week, a listener question led to a mention of the final episode of Halt and Catch Fire. An episode you alluded to hit me very personally because it echoed a very real experience I lived through. The entire episode portrayed a very painful task of sorting through the possessions of a deceased loved one. The forming of the keep, giveaway, and trash pile, how everyone involved barely clings to strength while every instinct is to run away and cry, and the possibility that any moment you may find something precious that strips away that strength, suddenly making you break down. A few years back, I lost my father, age 59. It was very sudden and unexpected due to a seizure. We had a good connection despite my father being a quiet man who had trouble expressing his emotions. This only meant that my memories I do have are very few and precious, and the 20 years I felt robbed of may not have given me many more. This episode brought me back to a very painful moment, and I had to pause and take a break before I was able to return to finish it. Six years ago, I gifted my father a chrome Zippo lighter and engraved something very corny. Thanks for being a wonderful dad. With love from John. I'd completely forgotten about this until I stumbled upon it, sorting through the property. It was an eerie epitaph that broke me. I couldn't continue and I had to retreat back to another house we stayed in. Later, my mother pointed out to me that he must have cherished the gift, even if it was not, he wasn't very good at expressing himself. It was well polished and kept, but had some wear showing he used it often. My question this week is simple. When does art imitate life a bit too close for comfort? I could talk about moments in fiction that have various results in making me cry or not, but really what I'm asking is deeper. What times have these moments been eerily similar to an, uh, an experience and possibly forced you to pause and take a break to regain yourself before being able to continue on with an episode? Um, the, the Also, thank you, Jonathan, for sharing that yeah, story with us. So there's two for me. I, I don't tend to connect deep that deeply with TV. Like I connect and all I, I get emotionally involved with the characters. But I don't tend to connect my own life experiences to TV in general so deep. So I, I can watch or get through just about anything. Nothing traumatizes me or, or, or gives me that, that, that feeling of having to stop. But uh, having had someone very close to me attempt suicide this year, um, seeing the Crazy Ex-Girlfriend episode where she decides to try to kill herself was a little too real for what I thought was a light and funny comedy. Uh, and that one was – I almost had to stop watching that show. Yeah, um, that and thirteen reasons why having having yeah. had depression issues and had uh, stuff like that personally um, was those were really difficult. Uh, it doesn't come up on television very much. It happens in movies, but mm -hmm. uh, heroin use, yeah, um, really any serious addiction issues. Um, there's show there's shows that are, like intervention and stuff like that. I won't fucking watch like yeah. that. Just that is so horrible it's so personally horrible to me yeah. um so that but luckily that just doesn't come up on television too terribly often the halt and catch fire episode uh, a couple of years ago i my best friend died and i went through all of his belongings with his dad and it was fucking horrible yeah uh and so like that halt and catch fire thing i that was 
really painful to watch. The other one for me was, was Breaking Bad. Uh, toward the end, when he was administering his own chemo, uh, that was I was still doing chemo, and that was the most horrible thing I could imagine. So it wasn't that it put me out of the show, but it drew me into the show because I had been through all of that. And so every time they did their their chemo and their treatment and and the way that all goes and every visit with a doctor in Breaking Bad was some of the best I've ever seen. It was so true to life. It was so uh, so much how it was that it didn't it didn't kick me out of the show. It actually had the opposite effect of drawing me in more, but it definitely made it a hard watch at times. Uh, I mean, I've mentioned this before. And I don't know if this like is as directly personal, but now that I have kids, mm -hmm. I find that any time there's a plot, a particular plot that has kids getting harmed, has parents losing children, um, threats to kids, especially like particularly young kids, I just freeze up. I like I I can't handle watching it. You know, and not not that like I was like some. I was just like gleeful to watch this right, before. Yeah, like yeah. it never really, like really affected me. I'm like, oh, kids dying and stuff. Yeah, it's fiction, whatever. Um, but now I'm just like, uh, I can't process it. I can't handle it. So yeah. I usually just have to stop. Yeah, yeah. I've had another friend of mine tell me that that after they had kids, that suddenly like movies that didn't used to stand out on their radar now are like, what the fuck? Because there's a there's a like child kidnapping or or ki like harm plot. Yeah, it's like this weird emotional trigger like i have no control over yeah, i'm like, like ah, i didn't care about he... this movie before and now like Arr! why does that bug me so much but <clears throat> i guess i'm internalizing it uh next question comes to us from jonathan hapt michael who says hi dudes since santa clarita diet has been a fun comedy with a horror twist what are your pitches for your dream sitcoms featuring randy's favorite Werewolves. <laughs> you can include other creatures, but the lead character has to be a wer werewolf. Okay, well then I guess you don't need to hear my uh, How I Met Your cre Creature from the Black Lagoon pitch. <laughs> can you make the lead character a werewolf? No, the lead character... Okay, yeah, the lead character is a werewolf who meets the creature from Black Lagoon. There you That's go, it. okay. And he, he's, he's telling a story in the old folks' home for, for monsters. And so he's telling various monsters... Uh, every episode, how he met the creature from Black Lagoon, and none of the others think that cur that character's real. So there, he's telling a story about uh, how the creature from Black Lagoon, how he met, uh, how wonderful he was, what a witty uh, date he was, uh, how he was an accomplished underwater concert pianist, all these stories, and it always ends with whatever monster telling him that that shit ain't real. I figure they broke up because of the wet hair smell, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the the movie. Uh... We Live in the Shadows uh -huh. it was a, a pretty hilarious, very cheeky, I guess it's New Zealand, but you know, yeah. it feels like a uh -huh. British comedy like kind of sentiment. And it's by Taika Waititi, who also just did the Thor Ragnarok. And he's making another one called We Are Wolves with Reese Darby, who was part of the werewolf gang there. Yeah, werewolves. And the werewolves, not werewolves. Werewolves, not werewolves. Yeah, we're wolves. We're wolves. Yes. Werewolves. Um, and... I like the concept so much of just this like nerdy pack of uh, of dweebs that also happen <laughs> to be werewolves. Yep. That I kind of want that to just be an ongoing sitcom. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think I like. I think it'd be like a a one set like sitcom, like really limited, you know, small budget like Wings or something, where like once a month or you know once every full moon, so yeah, like once a month, all these guys show up on like a you know sundown like mid afternoon like they start showing up at the place and they all get locked in together and you know so that they then all wolf out for a night and like it's this safety place where like you know like guys you just know from like hey bill hey tom <laughs> like oh yeah how's your kids you know and so you just get this like only see these characters you know and then they wouldn't see each other for a month and they come back it's just like the mundane parts of their lives when they're not werewolves. Yeah. <laughs> but we know they have this crazy yeah. werewolf fuck party going on. And like on. at the end of the episode, like they all wolf out and like, that's it. <laughs> um, I also have an idea for a Queer Eye reboot, that, but instead of being Queer Eye, they're werewolves. And instead of uh, making their uh, their host fashionable, uh, they make them wolves. And But it is, is every, basically they meet them, two minutes later, they bite them, they become werewolves, and that's the show. <laughs> It's actually a pretty short. It's pretty short. Yeah. It's pretty short. It should be a webisode series. Yeah, they're like they're like. Well, here's John. He lives in the Midwest, and uh, as you can see, he look at that tacky is mostly, shirt. Yeah. Gives me his tacky shirts, and he lives. He drinks these awful drinks, and he doesn't want to talk to women. So now he's a werewolf. <laughs> 
the end. <laughs> Love it. Sometimes they just eat the person. Yeah, they just eat him. Twist. Yeah. <laughs> Alejandro Ray Zavada says, since we are talking about murder, if the TV dudes accidentally killed one of the hosts, how would you try to cover it up? Would hilarity, hilarity ensue? Who would mess up and get everyone caught and arrested? So I have two answers for this. Okay. First of all, Ashley hasn't been on the show in a while, and we've said nothing about it, right, guys? Nothing. No one said anything. She's she's also as not on far Facebook. as we all know, she's still out there doing other. She's things. not on Facebook anymore. But as far as we all know, she's out having a happy life, probably somewhere else. We don't know. We 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 can't say. But I will say for sure, the next time we have Kyle on, I'm sure he's going to fuck up and spill the beans. You better shut up, Kyle. <laughs> I'm sure soon they're going to find a cell phone uh, that will have a voicemail from Ashley that will. <laughs> I mean, our our whole like, if we killed one of the other hosts, it would have to be like going to their house and still like setting their DVR or yeah, something like, yeah. oh, no, clearly they're still watching TV. <laughs> and like Randy, like, oh, posted something else about Trump like a week after. So I guess he's still around. You guys could you guys could totally simulate yeah. the bot. You just just set it to be and <laughs> set it to be super liberal and uh, and weird and geeky and weird about TV. It just you randomly could, goes fuck Trump every couple could, weeks. You could simulate me pretty easily. So I, I think we would actually be particularly terrible at covering this up because we've watched a shitload of television. Yeah. Because like cops on television and forensic evidence on television and stuff, all of this shit works amazingly well, and they get yeah. DNA trace evidence. The yeah. <laughs> you to the crime and all the and the boys in the lab get it done and everything comes back and in real life like the dallas labs like a decade behind and they were using gypsum for cocaine and got most of their cases thrown out the houston lab got shut down detectives like, really actually just go up and go did you do it you i do don't it? know seriously how nope. the f i used to wow. say i don't know how anyone before 1970 got caught for anything but honestly i don't know how anybody now gets caught for anything like I, I feel like we would cameras. I feel like we would fuck right. things up because we would get to overthinking it and be like, no, no, we've got to cut the body into a bunch of parts like the Danny Boyle movie, and then we got to bury it in a bunch of places. Yeah. And the cops would be like, if you had just dragged him into your backyard and buried him, we would we have, have never, never known. fucking known. <laughs> but you guys had to make fifteen tiny mounds around the city. I'm like Kyle's a big dude. I don't know. <laughs> I think uh, we're thinking of murdering Kyle, Kyle. You're fine. <laughs> Come on the show. You're fine, Kyle. Don't worry about it. Uh, Benjamin Hamill says, since it seems every damn show from before the year 2000 will eventually be remade, what are some of the shows you think could work in a modern update, and what shows do you wish TV developers would keep their damn grubby hands off? I'm ready off? for a new Mindy project. <laughs> She's already. <laughs> he says, example, I think uh, a modern take on The Fugitive could be really interesting. I would like to see what a reboot of Westworld would look like. You didn't say che you didn't say Cheers <laughs> no. first off, uh, but yes, okay. I was <laughs> running. I was running with Les's joke. I think Lost is an idea that's time has come. Uh, yeah, I could I could be down for some more Lost. Depends on the, the people behind it. Uh, they'll never do this, but I would love to see Babylon Five redone with the current technology and with thirteen episode seasons, knowing that they had five seasons instead of the slapdash way they had to put it together i would love to see that done like that conceit yeah. was my favorite thing about bab five yeah was that it was going to be five years and they were going to shut it down because at that point in television nobody would commit to capping an end on anything yeah i would i would seriously love they'll, they'll never do it they will never do that i just but that's what i would like to see i need my update to denver the last dinosaur where <laughs> you know he's Still uh, skateboarding around with his crew. Actually, dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. <laughs> Let's get an update of dinosaurs. It's just that wacky it's all, dino family. It's all them surviving the post-apocalypse of the asteroid hitting. Yeah, it's it's a, you know one of them wakes up, the other one wakes up, baby, and like yeah. baby, baby, the the meteor missed us. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> We're still alive, baby. <laughs> Not the baby. I don't remember what the... Was that the not the mama. Not, not the mama. mama. Oh, yeah. boy. <laughs> like a little cadre of dinosaurs survived the yeah. Lost World, uh, yeah. whatever it's happened in the Jurassic Park series right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Charles Armstrong says, Will Grant be reviewing part one of Terrace House, opening new doors at some point? Speaking of heroin, Jesus. I must know his thoughts on you die, which uh, not the only comment we got on this. Uh, Mike Chung also said, Oh, MG, I'm re listening to older podcasts, and the way Grant talked about Terrace House is making me want to watch it. Slowly going to get addicted. What so, have you done, Grant? Apparently, uh, everyone's getting on the Terrace House bandwagon. You know and what that means? A full Terrace House podcast by Grant. <laughs> 
Every full episode, terrace, house. terrace cast. Every ha- every house. Every every episode. You know the thing about the show is it has live commenters as part of the show. Yeah, they have commenters who talk about everything that happens. Now For you me need to be commenting on the the commenters. It's, it would be crazy. It's amazing. It's meta. I'm sure someone's doing it. But uh, no, I haven't checked it out yet, and I'm kind of afraid because that show is addictive crack. But I'll I'll do it. Uh, Alec Miracle says, dudes. I found you guys originally through Spill.com on the Leog, but how did you guys come to meet each other? Um, through through Spill? <laughs> through Spill.com. <laughs> yeah, uh, Randy uh, was one of the guests on a League of Extremely Ordinary Gentlemen, and that's how I met him. I met Greg back when Greg was part of the podcast. Uh, also through, through uh, I think I hung out with him at a bar when our buddy Martin like said, hey, come to meet this guy at the bar. And then Greg just got brought on as the basis of that show. And so that's how we all met. Les and I met. We were handcuffed together in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. They actually made a movie of this. Yeah. Uh, J.K. Simmons played me and Brad uh-huh. Pitt, I think, played Randy. That's right. Yes. Uh, wow. That's pretty uh, crazy fucking casting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought it was weird. I thought it was weird. It's, but... It is a little strange, but... Brad was insistent he could bring me to life. Yeah. Okay, okay, fair, and, you know, fair enough. Jackie I need to Simmons, see this. man. Uh, no, I met Randy. I think through Chris Nichols, probably through uh, the first couple of years of Staple. I, I think, think that's when right. I first yeah, met, yeah. Uh, Independent Comic Expo in Austin. Yeah, and first then, I met you was when you came on a podcast. Yeah, and then uh, we, <laughs> Randy and I were shit. It was probably MySpace then, but uh, no, it was Facebook. It was yeah, Facebook, yeah, but yeah. like we've connected through online stuff and stayed in touch and. Uh, we even talked though, a lot about TV. Yeah, even though we really didn't know each other that well. And then uh, when you brought up your uh, podcast about dogs, I had actually seen that show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ended up doing a couple of the episodes for uh, Beach Cop Detectives yep. and then guested because uh, I guess Greg had just left. Yep. Yeah, we were like bringing in some people and I was like, uh, Les's voice is really good. <laughs> we should have him I got on to stay there. on the island. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that goes. That's a lesson to you guys. Have a good voice. You, you can be on the TV. By the way, uh, to complete this, even though they're not here and definitely still alive, mm-hmm. I met Ashley uh, through Liag as well, I believe, because she used to guest on there. No. Uh, yeah. Did yeah, she? She was. She was part, of, or at least part of the One of Us dot, dot net crew. She's part but of the One of Us crew. I no, maybe the what's that's where I met her from. But I met her through the same people. Yeah, because you met her and you like should come over and play like your Randy plays games. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, I met her at the Halloween party that was that was the Leog Halloween party at one point. That's uh, the first time I met her. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I, I don't know if she was ever on Leog. I don't recall. She might not have been, but she, she knew all those guys, and that's where I met her originally. It was quite a drunken time for me, yeah. so I don't remember a lot about that. And I remember Kyle, because he came into town with our buddy Dimitri at the same time. Kyle was a fan of Spill.com. Kyle and Dimitri and Amanda guested on a TV Dudes podcast with us. Yeah. And there is a video that is like Three's Company intro with all of them on it. <laughs> and that's when I first met Kyle. And then, yeah, he became friends. I and... met Kyle, Ashley, and Grant all through doing the show. Yep. And, and by the way, and we're all stuck together. Yeah, now. let me let me reiterate. Ashley and Kyle definitely still definitely alive. alive. They're all alive. I don't even know why it's a question. Yeah, that's a weird question. Why would you even ask that? All right, let's get to our last question um, and move away from that topic. Michael Gassini says, between all the streaming services, it feels like we are getting nearly three whole seasons of TV dropped on us every Friday. Yes, it does. I agree with that. And if, if uh, you're dealing with Randy, you're required <laughs> by homework why, to watch all of that. Yeah, and this is why you don't have to make time for Roseanne. <laughs> really don't, that's right. It's come to a point where it doesn't matter how many people have seen it. A true success now seems to be measured by how long people talk about it after it's been released. With all the content to choose from, what do you dudes think are the most important factors for a show to get public attention and staying power and not simply remain the talk of the week or worse? That is a really excellent question. I don't know what it is about that makes a Stranger Things have such sticking power that everybody still talks about it regardless of when it's on or not. It, it, that one played on all of our nostalgia yeah. and... Yeah. I mean, that one is transcendent. <laughs> yeah. So, so like the the OJ thing was very well done. Yeah. But was also like weirdly taught, like deliciously gossipy. Yeah. Like, and so it, it was it was perfect water cooler type fare. But I think a lot of these shows that are talk of the week, uh, it's just because they they hit upon a topical issue or they they just happen to premiere at the right moment or they get a lot of hype behind it you know the a star fucked up or did something um 
the ones that stay are like Stranger Things, where they've got a they're not just hitting on one note, they're hitting on like four or five, and everybody's doing great jobs at it. Like you may think Stranger Things is derivative eighties pablum, and it is, but <laughs> It's incredibly well done, 80s Pablum. It, it, if a show can make you think about it longer than uh, a couple days, I think that also matters. I mean, yeah. I'll binge through a show and I'll be like, huh, that was really good. And then like an hour later, I'm not even thinking about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. But I loved, like Good yeah. Place, I can't stop thinking about like, it. I right. love Santa Cl- Clarita Diet and I, yeah. I plowed through it in no time, but it's it's kind of candy fluff and, yeah. and I forget about it really quick. Yeah, next week I won't be thinking about it at all. Whereas like Mindhunter kind of stuck with me yeah. or... Uh, yeah, yeah, some of these other shows like kind of get in your head, and pacing has a lot to do with that. Mm-hmm. Whether something's bingeable, Handmaid's Tale was coming out week to week, but it was fucking with me. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, like, there's even shows that are like that I really, like. I love Un- Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, mm-hmm. but once it's over, I don't think about it again. It just disappears out of my mind. The nice thing about this, though, the streaming is that shows don't have to be all like water cooler talk. You watch people discover. I watch people discover Future Man in waves. Yeah. Like, like someone, someone would talk about it, like, this is the most amazing show ever. And we talked about it three weeks ago. And I have a friend who just discovered Sense8. Yeah. And she's like, this is the best show ever. And I'm like, yes, it is. It's amazing. I was up on it. But, you know, anyone discovering a show, you can find these shows. Like, people are going to discover Altered Carbon all throughout this year. Yeah. I have a harder and harder time with anything being water cooler talk because uh, there's almost – if it's going to be like that, there's this weird pressure when Netflix drops a show on a Friday that if somebody's going to talk about it on Monday, do I need to finish the goddamn thing? Yeah. And that's it. crazy. Like, there's too many shows. But, like, Mary Kills People and is on season two already. Unreal is on season three. Yeah. Uh, I just discovered another Hulu original that's actually, I think, from Awesomeness TV. It's Freakish. Yeah. Uh, that's a bunch of kids trapped in a high school when there's a mutant zombie-ish thing that happens. And uh, it's completely done there's two seasons of it i didn't know i mean i kind of half ass knew it existed there's so much tv right now that i love discovering this stuff later but it makes the water coolerness of it almost fucking impossible yeah that's true and then there's roseanne don't watch roseanne Why bother? guys yeah uh just watch one day at a time and stud seriously it's great <laughs> uh all right guys let's go ahead and uh put a fork in it i think we're yeah. done here yeah we can kill this episode. Deader than Dan. You know what? This episode, very much alive. Very much alive. Very much alive. Nothing is, no one is killed. Nothing is dead. And if the cops talk to you, that's what you tell them. TV dudes out. independently run podcast and a member of the permanent record podcast network we are exclusively listener supported if you'd like to help us out please go to patreon.com slash tv dudes you can like us on facebook and twitter at tv dudes and help us out on itunes by giving us a five-star rating and writing a review to find out more about us go to the tv dudes.com and permanent i'm grant davis thanks for listening